So welcome. My name is Cindy Lopez, and um, I'm the Director of Community Connections here at CHC. Community Connections is our community education and engagement group, and we're responsible for putting on events like this. How many of you have been to a CHC community ed session previously? Great. Any of you were at REV last weekend? Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to share a couple words about CHC and introduce Miko, and we'll get on to the good stuff. But um, so on your chairs, you had a couple of flyers. One is this uh, one with the four big circles on it. That's a little bit more about CHC. So CHC has been here in Palo Alto 65 years. So we have, um, we have mental health and education services for kids, families, and teens and young adults. Um, we have two schools, Sand Hill School and Esther B. Clark School, we have a clinical services division, which is made up of people like psychologists and psychiatrists and speech and language pathologists, all kinds of great child development specialists. And then we have our community connections division, which is part of what you're experiencing this evening. So um, we're really glad that you're here. If you want to learn a little bit about more, more about CHC, we have four areas of excellence. So we, uh, ADHD, learning differences, anxiety and depression, and autism. So, and we see families and kids, teens, all around those issues. The, I just also wanted to point out um, Wilson literacy courses for those of you who are connected to schools, and uh, you might be teachers, you might be parents, but um, we, Lisa is actually sitting right here, um, um, she's a certified Wilson trainer, um, Sand Hill School is a Wilson partner, so she, we're able to train um, educators and others in Wilson practices, and that's all about teaching kids with dyslexia really how to read. So if you're interested in that, you could probably catch Lisa after this too if you had questions. Um, and one last thing. And I left them on my desk, but I'll go get them. But we are starting, um, for those of you, anybody familiar with Penn Parents Education Network? Yes, awesome. So um, a couple of years ago, Penn became part of CHC. Penn and its programs became part of CHC. SAFE, which is an acronym for Student Advisors for Education, um, they had groups of kids, SAFE groups, um, of kids, uh, middle schoolers, high schoolers who met all kids with learning and attention issues, and really learned a lot about self-advocacy and did some project work. And we're starting those groups up again. So I have a flyer about that. If any of you have students or kids who might benefit from that. So on with the good stuff. Um, so I have to look at my notes about Famico because even though I've known her now for several years, I also have to look, I also, need to look at all of her accomplishments because it's a long list. So, um, and I always ask you this, <laughs> pronounce your last, last name. Yeah. <laughs> Haft. 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 I was going to say Haft. 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 So, um, Dr. Fumiko Haft is a psychiatrist and cogn cognitive neuroscientist. She is the professor of psychological sciences and the director of the Brain Imaging Research Center, Center at the University of Connecticut. Um, some of you know her because she's also connected to UCSF and the Dyslexia Center here and the Brain Lens. Um, she does the Brain Lens work here at UConn, too. We have two labs on okay. the UCSF and UConn. Okay. So um, her research focuses on all kinds of things around the brain with learning, reading acquisition, dyslexia, and then also concepts around motivation and resilience, too, so social-emotional learning. And there's lots of tools that her team is developing as well, and she'll probably be able to talk about some of those tonight. So she's published lots of articles. You've probably read some of them. You've seen her talk before. She did a TEDx. And I also heard you've been at the White House. <laughs> so, so thank you for coming here tonight, and I'll turn it over to you. So thanks very much for being here. I know it's a really busy time of year, and it's a really busy day of, uh, day, time of the day as well. So thank you very much for being here. And um, 
So I have to rush to the airport after this to take the red eye, so I apologize. I'm, uh, but I think I, I have time until 8 o'clock, and then I have to rush home, put the kids to bed, and then go to the airport and get on the red eye. Like all of us juggle around work and home and other things all the time. So today I'm going to talk about neuroscience of dyslexia. A lot of it also will be talking about n neuroscience of learning differences or learning disabilities as well. Now I want to introduce the concept of, um, of the deficit model that us as scientists have focused on for a long period of time because that's where the federal government, National Institute of Health, give us a lot of money to do research and, and most of our funding comes often from NIH. And, but also moving into more of the ways we can think about the child as a whole and how we can think about promoting resilience and compensation in children with learning differences. And that part will largely apply to all kinds of learning differences. I know it's almost rare and hard to find a pure dyslexia in a way. I, I talked to a parent several days ago who their child had a textbook dyslexia and I was so surprised because it's really hard to um, meet one of those children these days. You almost feel like you has, they have writing issues, executive issues, um, um, attention um, problems, and so on. So, um, so I think it's, it's very obvious probably to the parents and educators that you, we should be looking at the child as a whole rather than just focusing on the reading issues, but that has, we as neuroscientists are responsible for being very narrowly focused and we want to start, we have started to broaden that as well. So I know um, some of you were at, at EdRev. I had the opportunity to present a very similar talk or almost identical talk at EdRev. So this is me last weekend giving a talk there. And I was very nervous because um, I had my eight-year-old son sitting right in front of me. <laughs> I often have... Uh, I often have their pictures in my slides if you've been to one of my talks, but I knew I couldn't talk about them at the intro into the conversation because I know he would get upset. So I had to talk about something else or start in a different way. And then he asked me, he, do, he hates writing, he hates reading, but he asked me for a pen and pencil. So I said, oh wow, this is great. He's going to do something while he's listening to my talk or, or whatever he's going to be doing. And I asked him what he was doing. He said he was going to take notes. And, um, and I said, oh, you're going to take notes? How do you know what kind of things to pay attention to? And he, he winked and said that he's been to some of these, so he knows kind of the <laughs> notes to tell or what to look for. <laughs> Before I st started, I was standing at the podium. He came up to me, pulled my arm and said, a sleeve and said, you need to look enthusiastic and you can't look at your notes. And I said, <laughs> I don't have notes with me, so check. And then I'll try to be enthusiastic. After the talk, he showed me his notes, or he didn't show it to me, he had it, so I took a look at it. I know it's hard to read, so I'll read it. It says, I drone too much, I was too quiet. She said, um, too much. I may have said several already. Didn't use hand signs, gestures, so I'm gonna try to use that more today. And sounds bored with a, only a hint of enthusiasm. <laughs> So I think we're going to try to put him in speech camps and other things and leadership so he can maybe have a job sometime in the future for coaching. But so maybe you can take some notes and give me some feedback if you meet my son in the future. And if I'm using gestures, please do let him know. <laughs> but um, going back to Edbrev, I've been going there for several uh, years now or many years now on and off when I can go. It's a fantastic event. It has a lot of booths. and. Um, um, students, artwork, uh, assistive technology, and uh, nice presentations. So uh, please do visit if you have a chance. It's on a weekend, sometime in the spring, usually April, May or so. I'm sure you're continuing next year, and I love it. Children love to go there. Also, there's a lot of fun activities for the children as well, and it's a, it's a great family event to bring your children. I just wanted to acknowledge some of our uh, foundations and agencies and individuals that are supporting our work. You can visit our website. I'm not going to read off of this, but I wanted to acknowledge our, our sponsors and supporters. And we can't do any of our work that I'm presenting today without them. And in terms of our collaborators that, were, uh, that worked on the projects, you can visit our website also to see um, who we collaborate with, but I'll try to highlight with some photos and the names at the bottom for the actual individuals who did the work. 
So I want to start with um, Jack Horner. If you've been to my talk, I often use him as, an, uh, as a starting point. I will let you know that we're working on a graphic novel together, so we meet or talk every couple of weeks and trying to flesh out how we can combine a graphic novel with neuroscience and paleontology and dyslexia. So maybe in several years it might happen. We're brainstorming and, and exchanging notes at this point. But uh, how many of you know Jack Horner? Maybe I gave away the answer a little bit here, but we'll see. Um, so Jack Horner, I said I'm um, now. I, hopefully no one's counting how many times I say I'm um, here. So Jack Horner, he graduated from high school with D minus minus minus. My husband tells me that there's no such thing as D minus 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 in the United States. I, didn't, I wasn't educated in the United States, so I don't know. But according to Jack Horner, I confirmed with him recently, he says that he did receive D minus 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 on several of his subjects. Um, at that time, you could, he, if you graduate from high school, you could enter college. So he went to Montana State University, and he failed college seven times. So this will tell you something about him right there. He had a GPA of 0 .06. He never graduated, but he never graduated. I don't want to give away too much. And he was severely dyslexic. So how is he like now? He's a paleontology professor. He's an advisor of Jurassic Park 1, 2, and 3 in Jurassic World. He's a partial inspiration for Alan Grant in the movie and has won the MacArthur Genius Award as well as many other awards. So you can tell that he was clearly success successful despite having dyslexia. He does claim that he never read and he never he still doesn't read and doesn't like reading, and that served him well. He claims that because he didn't spend his time reading, and instead he could spend time thinking and creating and discovering, and that led to major discoveries that led to who he is today. I wouldn't recommend it not learning, trying to learn to read, but uh, that's one thing we disagree on when we're in symposium together. But uh, nevertheless, he's a success story. But he did struggle, of course, as a child. He says that his mother was very supportive and he was very, um, and that was his uh, place where he got uh, comfort and support. But I think this shows us the importance of resilience and the importance of the environment and the supportive community. And of course, reading interventions, I will say next to him that reading intervention is important despite what he might think. But it also tells us the importance of looking at an individual as a whole and including literacy, but also other aspects such as resilience, social emotional aspects, and other cognitive abilities perhaps that he, he possesses. So this is a segue into our conversation today and, and talk. I do have a lot of time left at the end for questions, but if you do have clarifying questions, please do feel free to ask. If it gets too long, we might shift those questions toward the end. So I'll talk about the science. Uh, the reading deficit model, which is a historical model that we talked about that people focused on, but as a recap of what's the brain basis underlying dyslexia. And then we'll talk about the other non-reading, non-language processes that are important in dyslexia. We'll talk about compensation and resilience. We'll define that and we'll <coughs> focus particularly on cognitive and social emotional factors that are really important and that are emerging in the field right now. And also, um, it, toward the end, I will talk about a prize as an example of a risk assessment app that we're developing. I do have a conflict of interest because I developed it with my colleagues, but we're not making money off of it. It will be a freely accessible app that we uh, that is meant to be a universal screener in children of age three to eight, and how we will talk about how we're developing it but we'll also talk about the importance of early identification and intervention of dyslexia risk and the development current status and future steps. So I'll talk about the reading deficit model first. So reading is complex, as we all know. It seems to come easily to some, many, many of us, but it's a it's really difficult issue for many other children. And it seems like you have notes, that's great. I have a couple of additional slides to it, but I don't think those are critical slides, so I think you have most of the slides, except for for privacy. And in case it gets into my son's hands, I don't think you have the picture of my child in there. So reading is a skill that's unique to humans. We don't see too many dogs going around reading. I'm sure he'd love to read this book. It says, How to Live with a Cat. And also scientists have done work with uh, primates and some people have published in science and other journals claiming that you can teach primates to read. 
but it's still controversial, and a lot of the scientists don't believe that anyone other than, or anything, or any animals other than humans can read. It's an evolutionary new skill that was discovered or developed about 6,000 years ago with no time for a dedicated brain circuit to have a fall. So this is, this was made famous in Stan DeHane's book, for example, if you've read his book, and it talks about how we have these old ancient uh, brain networks that has evolved for speech and vision, but not for reading, and we co-opt those networks that allows us to read, which makes it extra complex. Also, if you look at humans, the parts of the brain that are most advanced and big compared to other animals are these associative areas, the areas that connects between different senses and different parts of the brains, like the temporal parietal region above the ear that we'll be talking about, the frontal part of the brain that we'll also be talking about also. So these regions are also critical and most probably critical for reading and dyslexia. Uh, it needs to be explicitly taught in most cases but it's also heavily influenced by culture and writing system. So for example, if you look at these Chinese characters, Chinese characters for Do is above, and there's a semant uh, semantic radical, that means wheat here, phonetic radical that carries the sound on the right here, and that conveys the meaning as well as the sound. And then there's a, a, a Italian, for example, which is very transparent. So even if you don't know, how, don't know Italian, if you taught the basic rules of decoding, you can learn to read even though you might not understand the meaning. But it's a very e e easy process. People say that in the United States, it takes about three to four years to become a competent reader. In Italy and Finland and these kind of other countries where they have s transparent orthographies, it might take one year to accomplish that same amount of uh, uh, reading. Do, uh, this is a word particularly that's not transparent and is a, a you, you can't apply the decoding rules to read. So English is a very, very complicated writing system. We know that it's heritable about, if you have a family, family close family member with dyslexia, for example, a parent or a sibling, you're one, you have, your offspring has a one in two probability, or possibly one in three probability of de uh, developing dyslexia. And of course, if you have more family members with dyslexia, if you have closer family members with dyslexia, that all adds up as cumulative risk. And also reading is heritable as well. It explains about 30 to 60% of the variance depending on the kind of research that you do. And also there's a universal neurobiological substrate for reading and dyslexia. These are two circles here. One is the temporal parietal region that I talked about that we'll be talking about extensively at the first half of my talk, it's, which is known as a phonological region or grapheme phoneme conversion region where you integrate visual and sound. And then orthographic region, the occipital temporal region is toward the back of your brain at the bottom, which is more important for the visual aspects of the words and uh, processing lex what's known as lexical processing or visual word form area you may have heard of and so on. And if you look at different languages, a lot of people have claimed in the past and even scientists up to several years ago, for example, Chinese uh, scientists have said that Chinese dyslexia is different, there's different genes, there's different neuro neurocircuits. And to some extent, it, it is true. If you use more attention, if you use more visual analysis to analyze those complex Chinese characters, you might use some of those systems. But the fundamental language processes that are involved are all consistent. And this is what we've shown so a couple years ago, comparing Spanish, English, Hebrew, and Chinese. And you see uh, these regions, which is primarily the phonological system, is consistent and overlapping, very similar in how they behave to process speech and print across these different languages. And so I think the scientists now agree that the fundamental linguistic network and others that we co-opt for reading is fundamentally similar across different languages. People are now showing that dyslexia exists in every language and uh, the, the, uh, how much the prevalence rate is about the same as well if you can carefully study whether it's Japanese or Chinese or other languages. So just as a recap of what is developmental dyslexia, they have significant difficulties in reading, in particular decoding words. It's neurobiological in origin, and it's not to the lack of opportunities, such as, uh, <coughs> such as a sensory impairment, uh, 
not due to lack of opportunities and also sensory impairment, intellectual, other disabilities, or English as a second language. But if you think about English language learners or immigrants, it doesn't mean that they're immune to dyslexia. They didn't get a vaccine or anything. They are equally immune to dyslexia. We just talk about the, talked about the prevalence rate. Even if you grow up in a uh, lower SES socioeconomic status family, a poor income family, you're also going to be likely to develop dyslexia at the same prevalence rate. It might be even higher because they might have less opportunities for reading intervention, for early identification, and so on. So if anything, they might be more severe if they're identified. But yet, this kind of diagnostic system that MDs or psychologists often use preclude them and makes it really difficult for these children to be identified, which is a big problem right now. They often have phonological processing deficits. It used to be that in every grant or every paper, we would say that the underlying cause was phonological deficits. Now it's changing a little bit. People are acknowledging that some kids can have dyslexia without phonological processing problems. Phonological processing is the understanding and ability to manipulate the basic sounds in a, uh, in a word. So for example, if I say bat, and if I say what, what happens if you remove the bus sound, then you say at. So that's phonological, if you need to have sound phonological awareness to be able to do those kind of uh, processes. It might be bat, if you replace b with k, then it becomes, yes. So those are the kind of abilities, rhyming, that you see and you think it's funny and the kids love in Dr. Seuss book. If you lack that, you might not find it as funny or interesting. And that's one of the first thing I noticed in our child as well. And then also um, in our younger son who was taking notes. Uh, the other thing that we noticed early on was when he was age two or three or so, that when we have these jumbled made up words, he really had a hard time repeating after. And he could only do the first little bit and then couldn't complete it when other kids were doing it at ease. Also, 5 to 10% of the population is known or thought to have dyslexia regarding the, regarding, uh, regardless of the writing system or language. And some people use a uh, percentage of 20%. So it depends on the criteria. It depends on what you include as dyslexia. So if you include some, some symptoms of dyslexia, it might go up to 20%. It might be even higher. It is thought to be that 80% of all specific learning disorders have dyslexia, but that might be also because that's the most researched uh, learning differences compared to others. So writing differences, they ha heavily overlap, math, different, math disabilities that heavily overlaps with dyslexia as well, but it's uh, heavily understudied and it's catching up now. They run in families, as I said. So in general, there's a four to eight times it's four to eight times higher than general, the general population risk if you have a close family member with dyslexia. And then one in two or three will eventually have dyslexia if you have, for example, a parent with dyslexia. And this term dyslexia is no longer used in the medical criteria DSM-5, which is the most recent version, but used in educational criteria such as IDEA 2004, which we need to get the IEPs and 504 plans. And this might change in the near future. I think there's some conversations, but I haven't seen any major movement right now yeah, so far. Mm -hmm. so you're saying that the term dyslexia is no longer used in the DSM-5, but it is used in the For, IEA. yes, so to get an IEP 504 plans, you do need the uh, criteria for uh, diagnosis <laughs> of dyslexia. So if it's not by the DSM-5, who can diagnose it? So it's interesting because even though it's in DSM-5, most MDs will not feel comfortable or neurologists won't feel comf comfortable diagnosing dyslexia and eventually you need the psychologist and especially in the public school system, often we need the school psychologists that are identified by the school districts if you're in public schools to get, give a formal diagnosis. If you're in private schools, you could get a 504 plan. Uh, you don't need an IEP because you you can't, you don't, you don't use that in the private school system, but you do get a 504, which you can go to places like CHC or other places to get a neuropsychological assessment, get these detailed plans. And of course, even if your child is in public schools, if the school refuses to do it, then you can bring your child to places like here and then get, get assessed and then submit to the, to the schools, even though I think there's no strict 
legal responsibilities and they may not necessarily take that, but I think often you end, they end up having to take it if you fight hard. <coughs> but, uh, do you have further questions? Um, I, I guess my, I'm, I work in public schools, mm -hmm. I experience most of the public schools I know, they will determine whether someone's eligible for special ed or not, but they will not make a diagnosis. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It hasn't been changing? No. All right. Can anyone speak to this? Because I know you, I think you're supposed to diagnose with dyslexia. I know at the superintendent level, people have avoided using the term dyslexia for the longest period of time. I was surprised, I was on the working group for the California guidelines, state guidelines, and when we passed that, or when we started, with the, the law was passed, people, at least the leadership started using it, and then they didn't stop teachers from using the, what they called the D word. Uh, but it still doesn't seem like it's changing? Or? For the ID. So your IDA uses the same term as? <coughs> and then you get the same. Interesting. Which I was just going to comment. I have a son who's now a junior in high school, but we didn't find out until midway through sixth grade because they didn't use the word dyslexia. And so you're, as a parent, you have maybe this 40-page report, but you don't know what it means. They don't use a word like dyslexia, which is kind of a trigger word, and it's galvanizing. And so you're lost in this complete jumble of opaqueness. And um, I think using a strong word like that is helpful. It doesn't have to be an out and out specific diagnosis, but it does help kind of point people in a direction and get them on the path. Yes, I think from the parent perspective, we've heard a lot on how that is very, very helpful. The International Dyslexia Association often gets kind of uh, input from the community, and that's definitely true. There's some a lot of researchers, it, it gets complex, and we can talk about this, this for hours, but some people have stated that the word dyslexia is not very useful because it's not like we have a blood test or there's, it's very definitive. It's also influenced by the environment, as I talked about, in terms of how much they might remediate or not. And so some scientists are very hesitant to talk about it, but we do, we do acknowledge that it's, it's very important and it helps people get services or be able to identify other families members or be able to discuss and, and get the support. Yeah, so that's a very, um, so it seems like it's a still a very tricky question. Does anyone want to add to this? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say, for the DSM, it says in the DSM-5, dyslexia, it's not a diagnosis, but it is mentioned once in like yeah. brackets. What they want clinicians to do, I think psychologists, is to indicate where is the student most be impacted. You can have the question be impacted most severely in, in writing. They might get it as a sort of an intellect or a specific learning disability in the instructions. They're really wanting clinicians to tease it out. Where does this student <coughs> help the most? If they have dyslexia, really says to indicate where they're specifically a good clinician will diagnose where they're specifically impacted and say symptoms consistent with dyslexia. It'll be kind of like a side note in the report, but they'll speak to where your child needs to be uh, remediated and helped and accommodated. Yes, this is uh, going to be a long conversation. <laughs> um, we can move on and come back to this discussion. I know there's a lot to be discussed and, and I know there's more questions than answers here. But yes, it is mentioned, not as a diagnosis, but in the text in smaller fonts. Reading and dyslexia is also a hard scientific problem and we're not saying this to say that, uh, to get us out of the hook as scientists, but it has, it's impacted by many issues that we already touched on already. There's genetic impact, neurobiological circuits are effective in different ways. There's a developmental issue. You're not going to see too many parents with a two-year-old come to a clinic saying that they might have, their child might have reading problems or not reading in their newspapers right now. But 
if you think about it, when you wait until fi uh, age five, age six, age seven, then it becomes a gray zone, and then before you know it, it becomes a problem. So it's really tricky to know, and many, I'm sure you heard the word that maybe they might grow out of it, and maybe you have to wait and see for a couple of years. And, and so it's very tricky to think about when you think about developmental issues as well, and who is ready or who should be reading but not reading when they're supposed to be. We talked about the culture and writing systems, and then there's also the environmental impact. So if you think about reading interventions, whether they're getting it, then it's an easy, easier kind of uh, differentiation of saying that this child is getting reading intervention intensive one-on-one -on -one versus not. Even then it's tricky because how can we define the quality of the learning specialists and so on. But if you go to a, if you go to a country where they barely have gone to school, if you see a 50-year-old or a 60-year-old who are not reading, you won't say that that person probably has dyslexia. Probably you'll say that maybe they didn't get enough education. So there's somewhere in between where it gets very, very tricky. And then, of course, there's this issue of mood and motivation and resilience as well. So we, what we ultimately want to do is to prevent some of these negative consequences of dyslexia. As I said, de uh, development, uh, the developmental dyslexia can occur in about 50% of those individuals with a fa close family member. And I said it was four to eight times higher than the general population. And the cost to an individual is high if you think about reading interventions, assessment, and, and the cost to uh, graduation, the impact on graduation, and, and finding a job that they would like to pursue. And then the cost of the society is large as well. These are statistics from the United Kingdom because there's not many good statistics from the United States right now. And the high school dropout rate is high as well, about two and a half times higher than the general population. And the prison population is thought to be high. Some people claim that about a third or half of the individuals in the prison system might have learning issues. But I think there's not really good science behind this yet. Most of the studies, if you read the scientific papers, will say that they did an IQ test to identify specific learning disorders. So you can already tell, if, uh, probably, if you're a parent, that this is not the way to identify individuals with specific learning disabilities. You want to look at cognitive abilities and say that they are bright individuals, but then they have specific problems in particular areas areas of learning. So there's a lot of work to be done here. Anxiety disorder is much higher, about twice as high than the general population. If you look at severe test anxiety, it's about five times higher than the general population. And then depression is about twice as high. And substance abuse also 2.7 times as high. And ADHD about 4.5 times as high. So if you take a child with learning issues, there's about up to 40% chance that they might have attention, ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity activity disorder, and then if you take a child with ADHD, then they might have about a 40%, up to a 40% chance of developing uh, or having learning issues as well, learning differences. And it's primarily around attention deficit type, not the hyperactivity type that you see often in those with learning disabilities. But even then, it's really hard to figure out which, what's chicken or egg. Of course, if you don't like reading and, and writing, then, for example, my younger son didn't want to sit in the classroom, and he would be walking around suggesting everything but sitting down and writing. And so they thought he has attention issues. He still might. We don't know for sure. But it's a, it's a very tricky issue. But what we ultimately want to do is stop the downward spiral, whether it's uh, neurobiological and uh, neurogenetically related, or whether it's impacted by the environment, such as in English learners and so on, then it could lead to poor reading, and which could in, in, uh, end, uh, end with a poor outcome, such as poor educational attainment, poor psychosocial adjustments, uh, poor health, and poor income, impacting the next generations as well. So the areas that we focus on is early identification and preventive intervention, as well as identifying different subtypes so that we can individualize and hope in the future that we can individualize interventions tailored to the each child's profile, but also to promote resilience and compensation based on their strengths as well as their weakness profiles. So if we go into the neuroscience of it, what we've known over and over and what you may have heard if you read the New York Times or some book related to dyslexia or learning issues, that 
the left temporal parietal region, which is thought to be important for phonological processing, graphing, phoneme conversion that we talked about, is important in dyslexia and reading acquisition. So this is the part that's primarily on the left side. We know that language is important both and reading uses both hemispheres, but it's still more heavily relying on the left hemisphere, especially if you become a good reader. In dyslexic individuals, some people believe that you're using both hemispheres, you're using the frontal part of the brain as well, and we'll go into some of that. So it's a, right about the ear, this phonological pathway is generally thought and has been reported over and over and over to be different and atypical or reduced in its function compared to non-dyslexic individuals. Also, people have reported the orthographic region at the back of the brain to be important as well. There's less evidence, there's a lot of evidence behind it, but if you had to choose one, it's more, it's stronger around the phonological system. We've shown that it's not related to reading level, so if you compare these children, for example, a 10-year-old child with dyslexia, and compare them to an eight-year-old child without dyslexia, but reading at the same level, the reading level, then we still see these similar patterns. So we know that it's not just their level, that the level that they're at, at the at that point, and it's not just due to developmental delay, but there are some, some neurosignatures in these regions related to dyslexia. We also show that it's not related to the definition. So whether some people say that, oh, you don't meet the IQ discrepancy criteria, or whether you don't meet the low achievement uh, criteria, these have been used over, the, over time, over the past couple decades, or the RTI model that we see similar patterns of uh, reduced activation or weakness in these phonological and orthographic regions. We also show that it's really small here, but we also showed that if you take children with typical reading abilities, so if you know these standard diet scores, they may be 100, so that means that they're in with normal range or they're pretty standard in terms of their score matched to their peers. And if you take a child that's really high in cognitive abilities, whether it's working memory, reasoning abilities, IQ tests, and so on, then you may, have across, uh, you may have come across some professionals that say, oh, that's not dyslexia. You may have come across other professionals that will say, yes, that is a good sign of dyslexia. And some people might say you have to look at more of the details. So I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you think that they are more, they might have a brain signature more like dyslexia? So their normal reading when you do these standardized tests, but their other achievement level is very high in general? Who thinks that they have more dyslexia-like brain patterns? Who thinks that they're going to look like normal readers because their reading level is normal? I think there's more people who raise their hands for that they might show dyslexia-like patterns, and that's what we shown, uh, showed a couple of years ago. Until then, there was absolutely zero neuroscientific evidence behind this. Scientists and researchers and academicians were completely split 50-50 in their opinion, but we have been able to show that they do have neurobiological signatures. And some people are very happy about this because it provides support when sometimes you quite don't, your child doesn't quite meet the criteria that uh, this gives additional support at the neurobiological level. We see that, that significant difference having them read at, at, let's see, the level of their peers because if they were reading at the level that they should be, it would be much higher, correct? That's the, yes. So, of course, some people might say there's some kids who are good at sports and some kids who are not good at sports and, uh, or, and good at music instead, and you don't diagnose dysmusia and dysportsia and, and whatever it is. But so it gets to be a complex issue. So just because we've shown it doesn't mean that it's all problem solved because I think there's some other, and also other issues such as resources. If you have a fixed amount of budget in your school district, then who are you going to support for first? And of course, we should be supporting probably most people agree that the most severe individuals who needs the support but so what you were saying is that if you have that discrepancy then then they should be at the higher level yes yeah, so that's a premise of um, of it and and they might not be lower compared to their peers because the other abilities are compensating for it also so right so it might not be so there's these kind of different issues uh, that are factoring in 
If you look at also the White Matter Tract, which is kind of like a highway that connects between different islands or different cities. So we're, when we say phonological, temporal parietal, or orthographic regions, these are sort of like cities. And the White Matter Pathways are the uh, highways that connects between these different cities. And these are critically important for processing and integrating information. And we know that this pathway also that connects between the different two different regions and passes it on to the front of the brain is, uh, pre is predictive of reading acquisition as well. So by measuring that and looking at their development, you can predict some of their trajectory. Of course, it's not 100% accurate because otherwise then there's no point of having educators, having learning specialists and so on. We know how important that is and how much children can gain. And, and so it's not 100% accurate, but we are able to predict, which shows the importance of these parts of the brain. Right, temporal parietal is a phonological region, uh, or uh, occipital temporal is the orthographic region, just broadly speaking. Of course, there's connections, reciprocal kind of impact to each other, and it's not that clear cut, but if you had to put a label on them, that's what it would be. So parents can impact children in many ways. Of course, we can provide a nurturing environment, provide them support, look for support, and so on. But uh, historically, what we focus on is the intergenerational multifactorial liability model, which is a complex figure, but basically it's saying a uh, diagram, but it basically it's saying that parents have impact on their children, whether it's genetic or environmental. And this is the intergenerational multifactorial liability model that was proposed several years ago. And then also in turn, children can impact the parents as well. You can see that, for example, if the child is really, really against getting reading interventions or going to more um, academic related activities or summer camp, you might say, well, it's a summer, let's do more sports. And then if the child is more academically oriented, you might promote that and they might go to writing camp, for example. So you can see how the child's reaction will impact the parents and can use their or impact the environment to their advantage, or advantage is not a very great word, but um, so there's reciprocal impact. And of course, there's non-parental impact as well. But we can categorize them more in, in neuroscientifically as environmental impact that we talked about, whether it's reading interventions providing that kind of support, but also prenatally, there's some impact on neurodevelopment of the brain. There's postnatal impact as well. And then there's also something called epigenetics, which is, there's, uh, the definition is that there's no DNA changes, but it impacts how the gene is regulated and expressed and the proteins that are produced. So it's sort of like a gene environment interaction and where it gets mixed. And then there's, of course, the genetics that's inherited from the parents. And then there's also something called de novo mutation. We'll get back to this later. But it's a heritable trait because it's genetic. But by definition, de novo means new, so new mutations. So it's not inherited from the parents. All of us have de novo, so we are, have mutant genes in our body, um, many tens of them. But uh, some of this can impact neurodevelopment and reading abilities, autism, and so on. And there's been a number of research on this. So these are just some of the impact that, or the majority of the impact that parent can have on their children that we're thinking about as scientists. So as a proof of concept, we started scanning the whole family. So we had the parents come in, the children come in, and I know there's a lot of very engaging dads here. Usually when I go and give talks, there's more females. Um, and uh, so I, maybe I should think in before I try to make a joke here, but I'm gonna say it anyway. So what we were doing was we were doing a study in the whole family. We were trying to get dads and moms in, and this is just empirical observation. So it's not about any judgment on dads or males or females or moms. But um, in our research study, we had the whole family come in. In our study, a lot of dads didn't want to come in because we said that we're doing cognitive testing. If they knew that we were doing IQ testing, brain scans that will look at their brain parts, seems like it wasn't very exciting for the dads to come in. Ch the children came in multiple years, so they were very excited that they had the opportunity to recruit their parents, recruit their dads to come in, so they really helped us. We didn't course the child or bribe the child, but they helped us recruit the parents to come in and the dads especially to come in, and uh, they had a, 
uh, kick out of training their parents to stay still because you have to stay absolutely still. You can't move millimeters, and that'll be too much movement, or the brain pictures will be blurry. And so they were training, helping us train their parents and their dads to stay still and go through this um, study. So we did this study. We got a lot of information from the dads and the moms and the kids, and more importantly, brain scans as well, which was first of its kind to get the whole family. Most all, any studies that has been done in depression or others has been just looking at the mom for whatever reason. Maybe this gives you some hint as well. So we got all of this. We looked at, we started looking at, instead of going into reading, we started looking at social emotional aspects and emotion regulation. A lot of the rodent and animal research has been done in emotion regulation uh, and, and the social emotional pieces. So we thought that we would look at that and see what we can find that might be similar to what people have shown in animal research as, as well as in depression. So in depression, people have said that depression uh, is more passed on from moms to girls, and that's more common. So we published this. We found these great results compared to dads pass passing on to their sons or girls. Moms were more likely to impact their girls and have very similar a cortical limbic circuit. That's really important for emotion regulation. And it was taken up in the uh, media a lot, including uh, Scientific American. So it says here, like mother, like daughter. The science says so too. This is a very neutral comment. And then before we knew it, and we didn't agree to this, but the Glamour magazine was very interested in this. And so they wrote, feeling extra emotional today, blame your mom. So, and also it says, no one can push your buttons like your mom, and new research has found there may be a specific explanation for that. You share the same emotions. So you have to be careful when you do your research about the consequences of what kind of articles will be written up about this. But this showed that it, we can identify these intergenerational circuits or how similar moms and, uh, and parents and children are in terms of the brain circuits. So we started and we're continuing our research, recruiting family members as well in San Francisco as well as in the, on the East Coast. So if you're interested in participating, brave dads, brave moms, please do contact us and we'd love to have you in our research program. So, but you can do other things. So we can start dissociating genetic and environment to nature-nurture debate and looking at uh, how research can suggest modifiable cir uh, circuits and systems. So if we think that it's, these might be the regions that are important or circuits that are important for, the, for dyslexia and reading, but there might be some circuits that are more modifiable and malleable and more environmentally impacted. And that might give us some hint on where we might focus on. So we did something called the genetic correlation analysis. We scanned the parents. We tested the ch uh, parents and the children as well. And we targeted these phonological and orthographic region. And what we find is that the temporal parietal phonological region is more heritable. The blue line is bar is higher compared to environmental impact. And it's slightly, but the occipital temporal region seems to be more, and the orthographic region tends to be more environmentally mediated. So this starts giving us some hint on uh, how to target different systems brain based on brain networks. And also research shows the importance of cognitive and executive networks in reading. I was just talking to Cindy earlier, and she was talking about how parents are interested in executive function. And I think it's really true of the importance. And I can give a whole talk on this. But basically, if you look at dyslexia, again, we have these reduced uh, weak uh, networks in these regions, but also there's a lot of other networks that are important. For example, the attention network at the back of the brain, executive network at the front of, of the brain, these are very critically important for reading. If you look at dyslexia, oops, uh, I mixed a slide in here, but so we talked about the malleable systems and we talked about the importance of attention and cognitive networks in uh, reading as well. It might not be the core language and literacy network, but these are important as supporting. So when you think about the child and where their strengths or weaknesses are, perhaps these are good targets to target, especially if they're weaker in other parts and they're not making great progress on the reading intervention <coughs> itself. Maybe it's, a, it's good to rethink about how else we might be able to support the child to propel on their reading uh, and ex excel their, accelerate their reading progress. So going back to the dad, uh, here's another one that's kind of a, it's not a dad joke, this is scientific evidence, but that we're uh, publishing right now. But it seems like there's a lot of evidence pointing to older dads. You may have seen the paper several years ago saying that older, if, you have an old, if you have a child from an older dad, you're more likely to have 
autistic children. There's some evidence to this, and there's scientific evidence, which goes back to de novo mutation that we talked about. So de novo mutation or new mutations, if you're a dad, then you have a lot more, sperms have a lot more cell divisions than eggs over the course of the lifetime, hundreds versus uh, 50 or so for women. So, uh, so every time there's a cell division, it's more likely that something's going to go wrong. So there's more of a chance that there's more de novo mutation. So even though this variance that's explained, so I don't want you to go back and encourage your teenage or tw children in your 20s suggesting that they should get married to younger men, but there is some, imp it's not about older men, but it's more about de novo mutation. So there's some impact that if you have new mutations, and in particular kinds of mutations, then it might impact uh, not just autism, but other neurodevelopmental conditions such as reading. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm looking, looking around in the room here. So I think the older studies have done it in uh, dads of in their 50s. We have our research study is a typical range, so 20 in the dads in their 20s to 40s, and we still see this effect. So th I think there's some linear effects of age in the, that typical age range, but I think there's some significant risk, or I wouldn't say significant, it's still a small amount of variance, and I don't want to make too much of a big deal out of this, but I wanted to share the latest results with you, but um, uh, if you're in your 50s or 60s. So some people see some more nonlinear trends in the 60s, for example. And then also younger, really young dads are not great, or younger parents are not great as well, moms included, but teenage parents also, not because they're young and they're not experienced, but also from, from kind of biological mechanisms, there seems to be something that suggests that there might be something there as well, even though a lot of the mechanism is not well known. But going back to the dad's age, uh, dad's age predicted reading ability, and it might be related to de novo mutation based on other research that's going on. But what the point here is that it seems like there's some, so we talked about the genetic heritability, how phonological processing is very, seems to be more heritable because of the temporal parietal region, orthographic region, we said that it might be more environmentally mediated. Reading seems to be impacted also in a different way, potentially de novo mutation, but regardless of the biological mechanism through an attentional <coughs> network. So we talked about orthographic processing, um, uh, uh, phonological processing, and then now we're talking about attention. We started talking about executive function as well. And this seems to be a very different one than the genetic mechanisms that impact reading through phonological processing. So you can start thinking about, oh, there seems to be many risk factors, and it's just not one thing that impacts reading and dyslexia, but there might be multiple, even though phonological processing is the, still the big elephant in the room here. So summarizing the neuroscience section, and we'll move on into the less neuroscience section, but uh, that there's a multifactor reliability model that might be impacted by many different uh, biological mechanisms, including uh, environmental Environmental, but it shows the importance of starting to look at phonological processing, but it's not just that. And it's great that now in the California law, people t are now supposed to pay attention to phonological processing, but also the science is moving on that we should be paying attention to attentional mechanisms, uh, orthographic processing, and, and we'll talk about executive function as well. That leads to reading and might explain a lot of the variance of their reading outcome. So moving on to the importance of the other parts and not the deficit model, I want to highlight the importance of other parts and how that might help us uh, promote children's uh, success. So we can think about protective factors. So you might see a child who might have a family member. I said it's one in two might develop dyslexia, but also you know that one in two will not develop dyslexia, even though they have the same parent. So how can that be? Do they have particular protective factors, or they may have missed some genes, may perhaps, but there, there's protective, potentially protective factors. If we divide them into two sections, either resilience or compensation. So compensation is when you're trying to get at the same goal. So we're trying to overcome their decoding difficulties, they become a good decoder and then but they're using alternative neural and cognitive pathways to achieve that so that's what's known as compensation resilience is where you have these you know, you might have five aunts and parents and uncles with dyslexia. You think that your child is going to have dyslexia, but they may never be diagnosed with dyslexia and sort of escape from having dyslexia or have only very mild symptoms or difficulties. And that we de define as resilience. So when you think about a um, 
for example, a palm tree that's swaying in a, in, a, in a storm. You see it sway in the wind, but you don't see it break. That's what resilience is. So, and we divide that into social emotional resilience as well as cognitive resilience. This is a little complicated, but all I'm trying to say here is that if you look at the past behavioral research on compensatory networks, most of the work is on language. So if you're good at language, it seems like they learn to compensate, whether it's semantic knowledge, lexical context, so they're good at reading context, or they're good at understanding text. They are good at morphological awareness, which is awareness and the ability to manipulate the smallest unit of meaning. So they're very good at kind of breaking up the word into like Latin, right, roots and, and base and so on. They're, they have very good receptive language, oral language abilities, oral comprehension skills, vocabulary, for example, and then, or they might be, or there's evidence to suggest that we might be using the articulatory network. So you might see children sub-vocalizing or kind of doing that when they're learning to read, and that's typical, and we see that in children all the time. Typically, you grow out of it when you become an adult, and adults with dyslexia or older kids with dyslexia, you might be seeing that. Our evidence, uh, scientific evidence, seems to suggest that that is uh, a good compensatory strategy. We haven't done this where we explicitly promote them to articulate and see if that pr uh, improves intervention effects. But that seems to go along with some of the intervention strategies that you see um, out there. That's it. Saying it out loud, I'm, I'm lost. Yeah, so articulation is basically saying it out loud. Well, but like it doesn't have to be really explicitly saying it now. You'd like me to do research on that because that's a real clue for, for teachers and parents. Yeah, so we have, we just got fund, her funding from Oak Foundation today that will be getting research funding to try to target individual, uh, tailor uh, interventions to individuals based on their strengths and weaknesses. We have also an NIH funded project that just started in September that will be looking over the next five years and how each young adult is using compensatory strategies and then we're going to integrate that together with intervention as well as looking at the outcome so we'll have uh, a lot more information over the next couple of years awesome. thank you okay yes thinking about that articulation of the compensatory strategy trying to figure out how that works is that possibly then if they have the phonological deficit but by articulating they, it's like the muscle and mouth positions or their cue for the so that's, I think that's a common, and there's also, even if you're not explicitly saying it and getting the outside <laughs> feedback, there's more internal feedback through muscle movements and oral motor abilities as well. Like people talk about inner speech and how that activates a similar kind of language networks and so on. So I think there's both, but we don't know for sure, but it seems like the neuroimaging <laughs> evidence and science evidence suggests that we've done a couple of studies kind of related to this seems to point to that as well. If you look at the neuroimaging literature, you, it looks quite different. It points to some language abilities, but these circles that you're seeing here are different parts of the brain that seems to suggest it's important for compensation. And they, most of them, or a lot of them, point to executive function, attention, effort, memory, and so on. And so how, what's the discrepancy between this neuroimaging research literature and the behavioral literature? And so what we think is that imaging allows us to explore the whole brain. If you're doing a behavioral assessment, if you don't assess them, you're not gonna know. So if you don't include a, a comprehensive executive function and attention measurements, which are hard to include because you have so many other tests you need to do to the child, then you won't catch that. And imaging allows you to scan the whole brain, so it might be exploratory, but it allows you to generate hypothesis that now we can move on and say, let's start measuring this more properly, let's start um, creating interventions that would help support the child. Hyperlexia? Ooh, that's um, hyperlexia in the sense that they can read well, but they don't comprehend the text well, but they don't necessarily comprehend the text. Um, can we, do you mind, if you're staying until the end, can we bring those questions to the end? Because I feel like we can, maybe address that toward the end and then keep on going with the presentation, if that's okay with you. If you need to leave early, apologize, but um, maybe we can touch base later. 
But so we, we started also looking at the resilience framework. So that was about compensation, how they learn to compensate, how we might be able to promote once they're identified with dyslexia. And now these are more of the uh, resilience factors. So we did an extensive literature search to figure out what are the factors that people have shown. If you just look for resilience, you're not going to get anything because that's a relatively new framework for dyslexia that we proposed a couple years ago. But we try to fit in this framework of cognitive resilience as well as social emotional resilience. It might help them, those with risks, not develop dyslexia or have less severe dyslexia, but it also might prevent those with individuals with dyslexia have a positive outcome. Uh, and, and the area that I want to focus here is executive function, just to keep the conversation. We could talk about all of these, but I know it, gets, it will get too long, so I want to focus on executive function. Seems to be a prominent cognitive protective factor that might promote resilience, and I will show some research about this. In terms of social emotional protective factors, there's a number of them. Uh, I think this paper can be downloaded. It's Hoft. Myers and Haft from Current Opinion and Behavioral Sciences that has a full manuscript. It's freely available to download online if you search online. But there's the three factors that we divided into. Internal factors, so child's factors, which is growth mindset, hopeful thinking, sense of coherence, locus of control, that they feel like they have control, self-determination. Of course, now the question is how can we promote that in the children? I don't have answers or else I have the perfect children by now. So um, in terms of family factors, their family cohesion, maternal affect, strong parental attachment, and then parental support and understanding of RD, or reading disorders. Peer school factors include peer relationships, mentorship, we'll talk about mentorship in a little bit, teacher support, and small class size. So these were the factors that we identified based on the past literature. So first looking at cognitive resilience, we looked at those individuals who are resilient readers. So that's defined as good comprehension despite poor decoding. So they might have suffered from decoding, they haven't been able to compensate, but somehow they can comprehend. So it's the opposite of hyperlexia in a way. And so those people have poor decoding or in orange, good comprehension, so resilience, there's a big delta. You, we compare them to typical readers who have good decoding, good comprehension, so there's a little delta, so little resilience. And poor readers, they have poor decoding, poor comprehension, and also small resilience defined by the difference between the two. So what is unique in their brain in, these, in this orange resilient reader group? We identify the prefrontal region, and this prefrontal region is the executive region that we've been talking about. <coughs> They were significantly stronger or better or bigger in a way compared to poor readers and also compared to typical readers. And it's especially interesting because they're even bigger or stronger in a way compared to typical readers. So even though they have a disadvantage in decoding, they're much stronger in these prefrontal areas. And also, if we take a child in kindergarten or in kindergarten and measure their brain, and then we try to predict who's going to end up being a resilient reader, then we get the same region, and it's also predictive outcome. This suggests that we can start early, we can start promoting these skills early, and, and that would impact their outcome in terms of resilience. So you can focus on reading interventions, and that's very, very important, but you can start thinking about other factors early and start promoting them early as well. And this region was in particular related to learning in general. It's known as a general learning kind of circuit, uh, memory, as well as cognitive flexibility. So cognitive flexibility is to inhibit your response and then flexibly kind of adjust your behavior and outcome. So we want to move into the social emotional resilience area. And first I want to reiterate some of the difficulties that students with LD, now this is more broadly into learning disabilities, but learning differences, ADHD experience. So if you take students with learning differences, these are in middle school, largely middle school students. This is one of the bigger studies that have been done. So we've looked at th over 300 students, and, and indeed, we're not the first to show this, but to reiterate what has been shown in the literature, they have higher rates of anxiety that those in green or those with LD or attention issues and also they have higher depression they have also a lower sense of mastery that they feel that they they don't have a good sense of mastery on their abilities and this is more general abilities not just on reading and they have lower growth mindset 
So growth mindset or fix a growth mindset is the belief that the, your ability, the ability can change with effort. Fixed mindset, the opposite is that your mindset is fixed and or you're, you feel like your ability is fixed and you won't be able to change it. So they have reduced growth mindset or more fixed mindset in a way. So we teamed up and partnered with a mentoring program called I2I, which is done in my uh, middle school children primarily, some in elementary schools, but it's a near mentoring program where, uh, sorry, near mentoring program where they use art to provide mentoring to students. And it's done, the mentors are high school or college age students also with learning differences and ADHD as well. And so when they, when they go through interventions, I know this is a very uh, busy graph, but I'm going to, I wrote it out here, summarize it here, but when they go through a year of mentoring, this is what happens. And we compare these mentored LD students with non-mentored LD students, as well as non-LD students who don't go through that. So there's two groups of controls here. So this is the first study in a large scale, that uh, first study of any kind that shows in LD how mentoring has a positive impact in a very quantitative way. So mentoring pr promoted social emotional resilience. And in particular, it reduces depression it re uh, and it increases self-esteem, but more importantly, it protected them from worsening of depression and also improved them. So it's protected against worsening of a de depression, drop in self-esteem. And so if you don't go through mentoring programs, you see a drop in this. Your depression gets worse, your uh, self-esteem gets worse. But you can not just protect them, but also improve on these abilities as well. And worsening, uh, you can protect them from worsening of interpersonal relationships. And also, interestingly, typical non-LD students got worse in their interpersonal relationships and how they rated them over the course of the year. So it seems like it's a general trend that you tend to feel like you're having worse interpersonal relationships. It protects them and uh, against those. This was measured at the beginning and end of school year, so it was one year. But you can stay on, I think you can stay on longer. There might be some people who know about eye, eye to eye, the specifics more, but this was only measured before, it, within a year, there was this much difference. So the mentors were people with learning disabilities, the same ones as the children? They're not completely matched, so it's not like I'm a mentor and I have dyslexia, you're a mentee and you have dyslexia, it's some kind of learning and differences. They're, they're high school or college age students mentoring middle school students primarily. Who are successful students or at least coping successfully with, they're in the, they're, they're going through the system. You know. We don't have to, ha they don't have to be compensated or coping, but they volunteer. So obviously they want to help other students and they feel like it may be mentoring made an impact in their life. And so they want to help other students as well. So that's likely true, but that's not a criteria for becoming a mentor. So what are the goals of their mentoring, the mentor? The goal is it it's art-based to promote so that you don't have writing and other activities. A lot of some of the mentorings might, or a lot of the social emotional interventions that you see out there related to growth mindset or others are often related to writing. So if you wanted to promote or reduce stereotype threat and feel like you want, um, and I don't want to go into the details of this, but a lot of the social emotional interventions are often writing based. So you write about what you care about your family members and that seems to have a long lasting impact on test taking, for example, and uh, growth mindset interventions as well. A lot of it is uh, typing or, or writing. And so this one is art based because a lot of the students have reading and writing issues. And so the, instru the instructions that the mentors are given they have a curriculum and then they focus on certain issues. They might have, for example, a garbage can. They might make a garbage can and they put all their ill feelings in it or figuring out ways to cope with it, for example. And so that's the kind of things that you do. Yes? Hi, um, how many times do social mentoring meet with the mentee? Once a week, twice a week, once a month? I think it's uh, somewhere between once and twice a week. I think once a week is more common. So the older model that we started talking about is the multi-factor reliability model. There might be many risk factors from phonological processing, orthographic, attention, cognitive functions, all very important. And that might be accumulative, uh, be cumulative in, in uh, impacting the child's outcome. 
and then we're talking uh, now what we want to promote is the cumulative risk and protection model. And a uh, famous researcher, dyslexia reading researcher, said that this, uh, the name is great because we're not kind of moving away from the liability and deficit model, but then you can't, you can't use that acronym. So, but I think it's a cute acronym. I know it's not a good acronym and it might be CRAP, but uh, so this is the best name that we have come up with so far, cumulative risk and protection model. That we have to start looking at protection, we have to look at their strength, we have to look at other aspects, cognitive and social emotional as well. So, and these might be related to neurobiological risk factors, but also it could be environmental risk, risk and protective factors as well, such as the one you saw here, which is on mentoring. This is just two examples of some other work that's done by other people. So when people are pre predicting reading comprehension outcome, instead of just putting in decoding vocabulary and reading and language measures, if you put in attention, planning, cognitive flexibility, these kind of measures, it added, to explain 26% more variance. So that's quite big when you think about how much variance or how much we can predict the child's reading ability and, and success. This is one on social emotional. They're predicting reading comprehension outcome here as well. If you include decoding, of course, decoding predicts comprehension outcome. We know this and we've known this for decades. If you just add mindset to it, it explained it in an additional 15% of the variance. So if you can explain 100%, then you're perfect at predicting and explain 15%, which is quite large in, in our field. So this gives you a hint of how we have to start looking at other factors as well. So this new model accommodates the importance of considering protective factors, and both models suggest the importance of other factors in dyslexia and their outcome. So the 41 mm -hmm. Flu, I'm sorry, it's an acronym for fluency. Yes, please don't tweet and say flu does impact, because I know. <laughs> Vaccines getting some hit for autism, and now flu might get some hit also. <laughs> but uh, fluency, I apologize. All right. So the last part, and this is going to be shorter, and I apologize. We took questions as we went, so it's going a bit longer. But I think the sh last part is very short, um, so it's, it doesn't carry equal weight. So I just wanted to introduce you to the prize as an example of a risk assessment app. So we'll start talking about this. And uh, as background, we know, all know that early identification is important and it's possible. This is just, just some statistics. If we can provide early intervention, it's four times, that's evidence-based, it's four times more effective than providing regular preschools. Yes? Yeah. I was wondering what early intervention is. Around pre-K, pre-K kindergarten is typically considered an early intervention. So this is the time before we are typically diagnosing our ch students with uh, learning differences. If we wait for one year, there's about 25 to 50 percent diminishment or reduced uh, effic efficacy. And it's not just this one first year. If you keep on delaying it, then for every year and every research study that I've seen, there's about 25 to 50 percent in multiple studies. It's not just this one intervention that magically showed this. So it keeps on reducing. But it doesn't mean that we should give up. Of course, intervention works at any stage. It just means that you have to do a lot more, a lot more uh, intensive, comprehensive uh, approach. So the return of investment is high also. There's about 16 to $31 of return for every dollar spent, depending on how you calculate it, whether it's local or global. And then risk prediction is about 60 to 80% accurate now, based on a combination of measures that we can include in a pretty quick way, I must say. And solutions for dyslexia works for all. The reason why we don't provide Slingerland or others at an early age because it's not scalable and it's very intensive, it's very costly. But the few studies that have done in, in non-dyslexic individuals suggest that it works quite well and it might accelerate their learning as well. So this shows that the critical importance of science-based identification and preventive intervention at the earliest stage. It depends. Um, can we take all the questions yeah. at the end? I'm sorry. So, so this is, I'm not going to go into details, but this is showing that if you have a family member, how their brain works are different, brain networks are different even at a younger age before they start, uh, as they start kindergarten. So they're not reading, but their brain lo looks different. So some people might say it's the, 
reading instruction that's different and, and some other impacts, but we see this at the neurobiologically at the earlier stage. At earlier stage, even before they're reading, and some people can pick it up even at an early stage. Some people say that you can predict to some degree, even in newborns, if you look at their electrical responses in their brain. And there's a, some great finished studies that have come out of this. So these just show um, graph networks in the brain in low risk and high risk individuals. This is a meta-analysis combining all the research that's been done from other groups as well. And we've shown in this meta-analysis that these hotspots, the phonological and orthographic hotspots, show up again as even without them being exposed to reading in a, in a formal way in school. So I wanted to talk about some of the key critical um, factors that predict outcome. So this is uh, the first piece is risk. And we talked about risk can be identified in preschool to kindergarten with 50 to 70 percent accuracy. I use the different, slightly different number, but it depends on the research study. It depends on what age you look at, and it depends on how you define their outcome as well. But one thing that you can really measure if you're a clinician, if you're in a pediatrician's office, that one thing that they can do tomorrow is to ask for family history. And we've been at the family histories that have been validated and, and used in the scientific community is extensive. It takes about 15 minutes of asking question after question of how you were like as a child, as a parent was like as a child, how they almost failed in school. And they ask all these questions. So we said we want the shortest the minimal viable, uh, minimum viable product. So we did a number of research studies combined with other research groups, and just today we got this final result. So it's the first time I show the final kind of questions that we think are most important. And we distilled it from uh, 30 to 60 questions that were out there. So these are the two questions that we think are most predictive of the parent's reading ability, but also the child's reading outcome. How much difficulty do you have learning to read in elementary school? And you have to ask both parents. And how much did you struggle to complete your work as a child? And even though this is not specific to reading, this seems to predict their reading ability best compared to the many dozens of other questions that are out there. This is focused on elementary school. I think. I need to double check, but I'm quite sure. I apologize. And this is the references, and you, all of them are available online, the full extensive questions. You keep saying online, but then we got these very tiny. Yeah, we can't read it. Slides will be on the website later. So, yes. If you do not get it, any emails you can send and ask questions. I would recommend sending it to someone other than myself, any email address you find. <laughs> you, uh, you definitely send it to me, but you might have to send it two or three times, especially if I'm on a plane or, or somewhere in transit. And so I apologize, but if you do send it an email to me twice, or maybe three times, I will definitely respond. And I have every intention to respond to every single email, and it's not personal. All right, so in terms of important and possible uh, other risk factors, we talked about the cat in the hat rhyming. So phonological awareness is very important. Letty's sound knowledge is very predictive. So b for bat, uh, ball, uh, for apple. Rapid naming, so you might see a color patch like this that's uh, repeated in, in, in randomized fashion, and you have to have the child name it as fast as possible. Rapid naming for color, object, common objects, letters and, and numbers. Letters and numbers are more predictive, but it's much closer to reading, so this is why we think it's more predictive. But these are really big predictive factors and also vocabulary as well. It's not predictive of dyslexia necessarily. I mean, it's a, a predictive of a number of different things, specific language impairment and so on. But the latest research, and this was from the International Dyslexia Association's Orton Lecture, Rick Wagner did this, but if you, in first grade, so it's not necessarily possible to measure in kindergartners or preschoolers, but if you can get a composite measure of ADHD, whether they have ADHD male, uh, it's not about male predominance, but if you measure, uh, ask if, ask or see if the child is male. Family history, we talked about this already. And then first grade reading, non-word fluency, oral reading fluency, response intervention. This is tricky because that means that you have to do intervention and you have to look at the response. So it's not really a quick snapshot. Listening, reading comprehension, discrepancy, listening and reading comprehension discrepancies, these were able to predict at 92%. But this is at first grade. If we want to measure in first uh, preschool, we can't do all of these, a lot of these measures. So we have to come up with something better. So we developed um, this app called the Prize, and and this is the last part. 
I see. We don't have an audio here. It is fine. Um, it's, it's online somewhere. If we can fix it later, I can show it to you at the end. It doesn't tell you anything about the content. So there's no content that you're going to be missing out. But it just tells you how we're using neuroscience in collaboration with Berkeley, Stanford, and UCSF, and other institutions to try to come up with these kind of solutions, such as the, the app. So a prize is a fun. It might be on the UCSF website. All right, well, thank you. A prize is a fun universal screener that assesses school readiness and dyslexia risk in young, uh, young ages from in the form of a gamified app. I have some demos here. Um, we've been developing it for a while now, but really we developed in 2017. We did our first validation comparing it to Woodcock-Johnson and other standardized measures in uh, last year in the in California public schools, and then this year we're doing it in east, east on the East Coast in public schools. And then in the fall onwards, we'll be doing a national validation for final norming and standardization, and then we're hoping to release it to the public at the end of next year. So if you're interested, if you have school districts, schools that are interested in participating, we're soliciting national partners right now to start in the fall. And we'll be providing tablets to go, and we'll be providing training. And it's, it requires very minimal training. All of us are non-trained, non-psychologists, and uh, we go out and do the testing, and it's quite reliable. So we can contact you through the website if we're Yes, I'll flash the email address that you should be using to get a response quickly. So these are some of our partners, um, including Decoding Dyslexia, IDA, and all these collaborators from academic institutions, as well as many others that are, and schools most importantly, which I have a list toward the end, but it's developed by a team of scientists <laughs> and developers. It's for every meant for every young child. It's meant as a universal screener, so not just for those at risk. And we talked about this already. That's a time for young students and, we think it's engaging. That's what the kids tell us, and we're not bribing them either. And uh, it's scalable. It assesses a lot of these domains. There's about 14 different games that you can combine from language, pre-literacy, literacy, motor, executive function, and cognition. I think what our app is, there's about two other apps that are in development by other academic institutions. And, but we are the only ones that have the executive function cognitive ones as well. Others are focused m most exclusively on literacy and language. In terms of the preliminary validation, uh, comparing it to Woodcock-Johnson, so conversion validity, it's pretty high. And we reached ceiling because all the kindergartners knew their letters. But it was also consistent with the Woodcock-Johnson assessment test. So our kindergartners mostly knew it, but uh, it was all very consistent. And we have very high conversion validity that we're very happy with. I can talk about more of the statistics and details, but we're happy with it. And we compared it against Woodcock-Johnson and, and other measures. So it's as good and similarly, uh, similar to the widely used psych ed uh, batteries. So we want to go beyond uh, identifying profiles and assessment. We want to provide teacher training, provide evidence-based <coughs> resources that we're working on right now also as we're validating that would ultimately lead to improved student learning. And I think the last piece I have is demos. Oh, I just wanted to show you this one that just came in a couple days ago. So May 9th or so, California governor just approved uh, some pilot funding uh, from their budget to go into California-wide underserved centers, uh, that centers that served underserved populations to do this as a pilot project, to do the assessment, universal screening, and then provide resources. So we're very excited that California is stepping up and be able to provide early identification and intervention. So just uh, one or two demos. It looks like this right now. I know it's not the fanciest. It's not Fortnite, but we think it's good enough for kindergartners. So they have hungry animals. And they have to feed the hungry one. And they wake up, they are hungry, and you do these uh, tests. This is a motor one. I apologize, something happened. So this is a motor one. Oops, I think I have to go. And so there's a hungry monster. When you see these bubbles, you move your finger and you pop it, and it feeds them. And this is just motor, so you it's an omnivore, so you can feed them whatever you want to. <laughs> it's kind of like me. Uh, this is a cognitive measure. Oops, I apologize. 
So this is a cognitive measure looking at cognitive flexibility and attention. And you have to um, click on the, let's see if I can get it right, click on the side where you see the animal. And then it gets a little more complex. And then light bulbs, light bulbs start flashing where it focuses <coughs> your attention and it distracts you. And you have to still stay focused on the task. And so these are standardized cognitive measures that has been done in research. But we modified it for in a gamified way. You can do it in small groups. So right now we're doing it one on one, and then we're planning on do for validation. We will allow small groups testing as well. So this is a uh, visual spatial short term memory, and I'll go to working memory. So you get the sense of what kind of tests they are. I apologize, it's kind of messed up, but these are validation partners and funders so far. I'm happy to take a couple of questions. You mentioned the orthographic. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And I was just curious what type of environmental factors or, you know, like, because I that one, this one doesn't tell you. I've had to work with the chronological process in deficits, and I don't have hardly any information about the orthographic. Right. So the environment doesn't mean, I mean, it could be, it, we don't know yet. So right now we know that it's more likely to be more environmentally media rather than heritable, but we don't know anything about it, whether it's any kind of environment. It could be the shared environment that you have with siblings. It could be the school environment. It could be anything. And we have to see if orthographically focused interventions can add and be more effective in some kids also. So, we're so information about that yet. sorry, that's a problem with science. We don't. <laughs> it raises more <laughs> questions than answers. Right now, if you invent one, please do let us know. <laughs> we'll help you validate it. Um, and then some other questions that I said we'd ask towards the end. Okay. But hyperlexia? Okay. I, short answer is, I don't know. But then we can talk about it a little bit more because I don't want to dismiss it by saying I don't know. But can we ask? Uh, yes. Um, or is there, with the newest research, evidence of the neural pathways changing with the interventions? So like if a student does an organizing <coughs> based program meant for kids with dyslexia, does it change the neural pathway? Yes, absolutely. It does change. It's a little controversial. Some people think that it's going to reverse it, so it's going to fix sort of the weaker parts. I'm uh, more on the, it could do that, but I think there's a stronger compensatory part that's using alternative pathways to achieve the goal that we want to, which is becoming a good comprehender or a good decoder and so on. So I think the scientists, scientific evidence are leaning towards more compensatory mechanisms, but it's, people are divided, like scientists. But, it, it, but yes. But definitely, the brain does change for sure. Okay. Um, you had well, a question yeah, earlier, what I really want to say and then I'll go to yours. Is this a prize app? So is this going to be a, a thing that people can do if they're interested, or are you going to sort of present it to schools? Because uh, my comment is, no one knows their child is dyslexic unless they are in this field and they've had exposure until it's too late. Right, so we are going to release it for the parents as well to be able to use this. And then they might be able to, we're going to release it to the pediatricians if they wanted to have it while they're in the waiting room. They want, might want to, the parent might want to bring their child in earlier so they can play. And, and then hopefully that they will print it out, put it in the doctor's notes. Uh, we will uh, have the parents. Parents will be able to download and test it on their child. They might be able to use it to kind of confirm their intuition, maybe. Or if they don't know anything, then they might be able to get some, it's learn something. Like so we're going to, to make it freely available to at anyone and everyone. So that's the goal. Um, sorry, let me kind of respond to the hyperlexia. So what are the interventions that are out there for hyperlexia? I'm thinking. I was hoping that I could come up with something good during my talk. I would say visualizing and verbalizing. Yeah, so when the bell bell grams is probably the best option. So they answered it for you. That's right. Regarding to your graph on resiliency, I've noticed that like so the child actually has a dyslexia. Comprehension seems to be driving the resiliency. Uh, 
I don't think that's true. I think there could be other aspects, because this was really focused on the reading and decoding and comprehension piece. But I think we're not looking at it through that lens. So we might be able to identify different kinds of resilience factors, strengths, and others as well. So we have to see it. It's really hard to get a large group of studies and, and children with hyperlexia. So that's an added difficulty. But I think it will, they will have some resilient factors, but it might be slightly different. It might not be the executive function. It might be more of the other aspects. It might be. So we'll have to see. I'm going to take two more questions, and I have to rush home. I'm sorry, to the airport, ultimately. But um, I'll take two questions, and then maybe we can. Okay. Um, someone can walk out with me mm -hmm. while we talk. There's a large number of students gaining a lot today. Mm -hmm. What's the impact on dyslexic? Like gaming. Gaming. So some people, so I don't want to bring up controversial literature, but some people have shown that shooting games or some kind of more kind of really non-reading intervention related games have impact by improving visual spatial attention and, and improve reading abilities. Separate line of research, visual spatial attention and, and phonological processing have are both kind of combined and predicts reading outcome. This seems to suggest, suggest that some of the games might work. They seem, uh, but it's also shown primarily in Italy where the uh, writing system is quite different. So gaming, I don't see any negative impacts except for if it takes away from the effects of, or the time it takes for that you practice on reading and doing other activities. Or, or So that's a major concern from my perspective. There's some people who claim that even some kind of particular kind of games might improve attention, that might improve reading as well. But that's still to be determined. And I think there's a huge pushback from the scientific community saying there's no way that shooting games is going to help attention and fix dyslexia. That seems like a really bad kind of a promotion. But but there is some research that are out there. But along those lines, something like Nessie or Fast Track oh, or Mind Play, I'm just curious how any Mind of those fit into yeah. to that. that. So. Mind play, I think mind play has some good elements. I don't think there's too much scientific evidence behind this. Nessie, I think, also has some good elements also. We did a whole search on all the um, online-based, uh, uh, these interventions out there uh, one summer, a couple years ago. And it seems like they had very good em elements in there. But of course, there's some limit to just using a gamified approach to. to Do you have like, a rating from that? Like, yes, we don't put it online because uh, it seems like some companies claim to sue people who do those kind of things. But we have done that. It's not a very clean format, but if you do ask me, I might be able to dig it out. Um, but it's also old as well. There's, I'm sure if there's more that has come out since. Um, shall we? All right. Well, if, yes. I'll <laughs> take. I think you raise your hand first, and then anyone else wants to walk out with me. Do you, can we? I'm sorry. I'm going to have to take this off so I can leave. I'm wondering if schools are not um, diagnosing uh, dyslexia or coming out right, and saying it, but they will do some of the assessments. What are the relevant uh, things on the list? Uh, the list and the the achievement test to look at to see if you can decipher if the school will tell you outright if the child has dyslexia. How? What are the relevant numbers to look for? Uh, and so, if you see a Woodcock Johnson or Woodcock Johnson or equivalent ones, Wyatt Woodcock Johnson achievement yeah. measures or yeah. some of the standard ones. If you look at word ID identification, word attack. These are word reading, these are word reading measures. Um, and then you want to look for if they do ETOC, for example, which is a phonological processing measure. Tower is a word, speed of word reading measure. So there's a number of those um, measures that you can look at. Phonological processing is not diagnostic. Reading is more of a diagnostic mm -hmm. one. Word ID, word, word identification, word attack, or, the, or tower measures. Is that? And then you were so mentioning that there might be a discrepancy uh, between some highs and lows because they might be compensating. So if you see um, reading that might be somewhat normal, but then you see um, like fluid matrix reasoning or visual spatial being like much higher, and there's like a 20 or 30 um, point gap, um, could, could 
that also is that normal for dyslexic? I think these kind of some of the reading uh, assessments will have these discrepancy measures that they will calculate. I'm not a neuropsychologist, I'm a neuropsychologist, so you could get some of those measures, but you could also look at it also. Um, but whether the school buys it is a, is a that's even tougher than ident being identified for reading and reading problems or specifically with SLD with uh, reading with problems of reading. So that's a really tricky one that's hugely probably still controversial and really hard to fight. There are some good neuropsychologists in the city who would help you advocate for that if you have those kind of issues. But um, you can do that too. Um, Thank you, Kamika.